Good morning. Main Street, so glad that you joined us again this morning. Uh, we are uh, continuing our series in the You Asked For It series, and we've been dealing with the number one question that's been asked uh, for this summer series, and, and what does the Bible teach about race? And, to, and we talked about that last week, and this week, what does the Bible teach about racism? Well, last week, we dealt with the issue of race, and, and I gave you a quick theology about race, and encourage you to go watch that uh, talk if you haven't had a chance to listen to it or watch it. And I gave you some uh, clarity on what God says about the human race. And we learned last week that God has created everybody. He made everything. He made everyone. He made you. And not only did he make you, but he made you in his image. All humans are made in the image of God. And, uh, and this sets us apart from the rest of all of creation because being made in his image means that we were made to have a relationship with the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ. It's quite amazing when you think about it. And not only did he make you, and not only did he make you in his image, but it also we understand that he made you with incredible value, that you are distinct uh, and unique in, your, in, in who you are. God, God made you. You're the only you that he has ever made and ever will make. Um, and we also learned that when God made us in his image, um, that he, he made the human race, and the human race came uh, from two people, Adam and Eve. Every shade of color that we see around us in, in the color of people's skin came from two people, and we talked about how that happened. Happened. But it came, and we came, from two people, Adam and Eve. And God planned it that way. And it was God's perfect plan, not to create different races, but to bring diversity and beauty and color and culture through one race that we learned is called the human race. And just as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, we said this last week, let me remind you what he said. We're all part of one body, and we all belong to each other. And there should be no dividing walls amongst us, Paul says. And he reminds us again in Galatians chapter 3, he says, that There is neither Jew or Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, if you, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What an amazing message of hope and, and understanding of how God has created us. And then we learned, as we cl closed off last week, we learned this one big principle. And the principle is this, what you wear is more important than the color of your skin. Well, what do you mean by that, Sean? Well, just quickly to remind you, we are told in Colossians and all throughout Scripture to clothe ourselves with who God is, his characteristics, love and peace and patience and kindness and, and gentleness and all these things that God wants to develop in us. And so we, as followers of Christ, we don't look at the color of someone's skin. We see Jesus because we, we are identified by Christ. We clothe ourselves with all of his attributes and his characteristics. When you give your life to Jesus Christ and enter into a relationship with him, you put him on. You wear his clothes. You take on his identity. And when we understand, and, and when we understand this, but, when we, but we fail to live it, you know, we know these truths, and a lot of us do, you do, if you're a follower of Jesus, you probably, I know that, Sean, I understand that, yeah. But, but we, can, we can know it and not live it. And what I want to talk to you about this morning leads us down that pathway. When we, do, when we know something but don't live it, specifically that we are made by God in his image, uniquely and distinctly, and that we are to see other people that way, when we fail to live that truth, we embrace this great evil called racism. Now, let me just stop here and state the obvious. Let me just tell you, you know, um, what the deal is. Because I am, uh, I'm a white guy, right? I'm a white guy, and uh, in fact, I come from European descent. Uh, I'm Dutch, is my background, born in Canada. Uh, I grew up specifically here in Chilliwack. And growing up, uh, I remember here, even in this community, uh, growing up in my high school, had very, uh, it was a very, very, non-diverse uh, high school. There wasn't many different cultures represented uh, where, when I grew up here in this community. Uh, most of my friends growing up were Dutch or German and basically well, were white and stubborn, if you can put it that way. That's basically kind of the, the, the stereotype we have of ourselves, right? And it was very different. And my community lacked color. And the community I grew up lacked diversity in regards to those who lived where I lived. And, and so I realized that some of you may be suspicious of me and you may be going, okay, Sean, why why would we even listen to you, some white European guy who grew up with a bunch of other white European guys? What do you have to say about racism? How can you even identify with this? How can you even understand uh, what this topic is all about? And all I can do uh, this morning is, as I talk about this, is, is to speak to it from God's word and declare it 
to be the evil it is. And it undermines, it destroys, it, it rips apart the very nature of God's creation of a single human race made in the image of God for relationship with him and for relationship with one another. And what I see is that this evil is being used by all kinds of people and applied to almost everything in our politically charged, social media, media posting uh, culture and climate. And my concern is that if we're not careful, we're actually going to lose the real definition of what racism is. Because let me help you understand something. If everything is racist, then nothing is racist. If everything is racist, then nothing is racist. So then, what is racism? Let me give you what I think is, is a clear definition of racism. Racism is this. Racism is an explicit or implicit belief or practice that qualitatively distinguishes or values one race over other races. It's the practice of discriminating against others based upon their race or their ethnicity. And that's a great sin, and that's a great offense to God. It betrays the heart of God towards his creation, which is what we've learned already, that all people are created in the image of God and therefore created for a relationship with God. See, racism is the claim that you have more of the image of God than someone else does. That, that, you, you are, you, that God likes you more than he likes someone else. That you matter more to God than someone else. This is the, I, the belief of someone who is racist. That you are distinct from the human race in a way that is superior to others around you. And this belief is evil. And this belief is awful. And this belief is sinful. And, and, and so I was thinking about this in my own life. Has this ever happened to me? And the closest that I've ever experienced, others lording over, their, over me their superiority, uh, were the times I have visited, interestingly enough, uh, the nation of Israel. And, and, and specifically, uh, we would take teams there and we would go down to what's known as the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. It was, it's an amazing holy site. If you ever have a chance to go, it's, it's beautiful, it's awesome. But, but what was interesting when I would go there and have gone there before is, is, is that I, I would go there to, you know, to see what's going on, even just to pray, just to just say that I prayed at the Western Walls. It's an amazing experience. And, and I remember as a, a tourist making my way down towards the wall and being stared at and sneered at by the Orthodox Jews who in their facial expressions and their gestures made it very clear to me that they were not happy that I was there. They, that they, they weren't happy to see me and no way believed that I should even be there. And, uh, and their indignation towards me through their spirit of superiority kind of jarred me a little, to be honest. Kind of, kind of made me kind of, uh, you know, startled, made me kind of look around, keep, actually, you know, pray with my eyes open because I didn't know uh, what was going to happen. And it made me feel uncomfortable. And maybe you've had moments like that and the feelings, you know, the feelings of not being wanted and that I was less than gave me just a small taste of what so many people around the world from different cultures go through every single day. This is a reality for so many people. See, racism goes against the very grain of the gospel and the message of Jesus. When he declares himself, he says this, that we must love the Lord your God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind. And then he says, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. See, when we fail to love others as Jesus calls us to, you know what, we, we end up quickly turning down the path of racism. And racism is played out both individually and institutionally. We, we see it in both areas, and I'm going to focus on the individual reality, but let me just say this about the institutional face of racism. You know, if, you're, if you are black or indigenous and living in North America, you're less likely to get a quality education, less likely to get a high-paying job, less likely to live in a more affluent neighborhood, and these are the facts, and often institutional racism is behind these statistics. It's a different life. It's a different experience. But let's focus on racism in its individual form today. Let's make it personal because, you know, we can talk about it from as it happens out there, but it won't impact us unless we talk about it from our own hearts. Look at it in our own lives. Let's make it personal today. And the truth is most of us would not consider ourselves and in fact would condemn racist, racism in every form, in every way. If you and I talk, I know we would have that agreement. If you're a white person, you would say that you are not a racist towards indigenous people or black people or Hispanics or Asians or Jews and the, and the list goes on. 
And so you don't, you don't wear a white robe and you don't burn crosses on your front lawn, right? You, you think Hitler and the Holocaust, that was pure evil. You, really, you readily condemn slavery in, in any and every form. I mean, there's no way you would, you would agree that that's good. You don't believe in segregation. You would never identify with white supremacy and supremacy. And it goes without saying that you would never take up violence against someone simply because of the color of their skin. This is, this is what we, we would say. We would talk about this. We would agree on these things. Most of us would say, there is not a racist bone in my body. You would say it, and I say it. But let's get personal for a moment. The truth is, because what we do is we make racism an identity. We make racism as, as that person is a racist, and we make it their identity. But racism isn't so much an identity as it is a bias, as it is a feeling, as it is an expression in our own hearts. And it surfaces in our feelings, and it surfaces in our reactions, and it surfaces in our choices. Racism rears its head in our lives through bias and acts in the shadows of our thoughts and the shadows of our behaviors, which is why we need to be intentional about bringing it into the light in each one of our lives. So where do we see the racist leanings in our lives? that are in the dark, that, that we don't maybe know about? What, what areas of, of your life do you need to turn the lights on and see it more clearly in yourself? Because we all have shadows of racism within us. Well, how do you say that, Sean? I don't have a racist bone in my body. I, I, I don't agree with you, Sean. Well, let me just throw some scenarios out your way and see if you can see some of the shadows of racism that maybe surface itself in certain situations. Let's talk about employment for a moment. Let's talk it this way. Let, let's say you're a business owner or an employer and you're looking to hire some people. And you've received numerous resumes, and there's no pictures on them, just their education, job experience, you know, credentials, accomplishments. And your team has vetted, vetted for you four resumes, four individuals for you to look at. You grab those resumes, and in front of you, you see their names. And here are their names. Their names are Melissa, Moses, Jenny, and Sherman. Those are the names you see. No pictures, no context, no background, just credentials. Now, you, as an employer, you're white. And, uh, and it's obvious to you that two of these candidates by their names, Moses and Sherman, are probably black in your mind. Melissa and Jenny, to your thinking, are most assuredly, they're white people. Who are you going to call for the interview? Who are the people that you lean towards specifically based on your assumptions of their name? Do you privately make an asset, assessment of worth, value, capability, likability based on names, even though all these resumes are the same. See, depends where you go with that, that surface is a shadow of racism in your heart. You may not have a racist bone or a racist heart, but you were being racist in that moment by the way you thought and perceived those names. By the way, all those names I mentioned, they attend Main Street Church. Two of them are black, one is indigenous, and the other is Asian, and they're all amazing people. Shadows of racism. What, what about this? Dating and marriage. Here's, here's an area that, that can surface some of the shadows of racism in our hearts. Um, you see a black man with a white woman on a date or even married. I mean, how do you feel about that? What do you think in that moment? Good or bad? Neutral or biased? Positive or negative? Where do you go in that moment in your heart and in your mind? I can tell you that I know people who are very uncomfortable with this. And, and if you don't like or agree with a couple from different cultures dating or getting married, well, let me just say, if that, if that troubles you, if that bothers you, I'm just going to call you out. You actually now have surfaced racism in your heart. Now, in God's eyes, listen, God's eyes, there is nothing wrong with interracial relationships or interracial marriages. In God's eyes, it's just two human beings that he created in his image for relationship with him and for relationship with one another. And if you don't think that God blesses these relationships, just open your Bible. See what happened uh, in a story where a white guy married a black woman. And uh, this marriage took place, and it was met with racism, and it was met with prejudice, and God stepped in and gave his verdict. He was white, she was black. His family didn't like it, 
including his brother and his sister. They wanted him removed from leadership because of this decision, because of this relationship. Marrying a black woman was, to their thinking, wrong. It was bad. It was unnatural. And that they tried to lead a rebellion against this leader. Now you're thinking, who are you talking about, Sean? And about who is this person? Well, he's a, kind of the star of the Old Testament in many ways. His name is Moses. Moses was the man. His wife was a Cushite, a people known for their dark skin complexion. Today, we know the land of Cush to be associated with Ethiopia. And so how did God feel about this relationship of Moses marrying a Cushite? Well, his brothers and sisters didn't like it at all. And God dealt his verdict. And in fact, he, um, he, he gave, you can read about it in Numbers chapter 12, he came to his sister Miriam and he struck her down with leprosy. And there's kind of an irony in the story uh, with what God did to Miriam. You see, if you had leprosy in that day, you know what happened? You became an outcast. You were rejected at all levels. If you had leprosy, you, you, were, you were excluded from the community. And, and, and so in her racism, wanting to reject an interracial marriage from the community, you know what God does? God ejects her. I think God made his evaluation of Moses' marriage pretty clear. See, these are the areas that can surface these issues of racism in our hearts. But I don't have a racist bone in my body. Maybe you do. How about false assumptions and acceptance? Maybe, maybe you read the story a while ago, just recently, of the white woman in San Francisco who called the police on a person of color who was stenciling a message in chalk on his own property. I don't know if you saw this on the news. The woman lied and said that, that she knew that, that he did not live there, and he called the police. He said, this is my place. I can do what I want in my place. So I know you don't live there. And she lied, and she calls the police, and, 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 uh, and, and, called, uh, and called out her, ra- her racism was called out in that moment. Her racism was exposed that day simply because what? She made a false assumption. A false assumption and pseudo-acceptance. See, a lot of times we, oh, I accept that person, but we won't ever invite them into our realm. We won't ever invite them into our homes or never invite them into conversation. And here's the thing where, where racism surfaces itself in the shadow of our hearts and our lives. See, people want more than to be accepted or just tolerated. People want to be embraced. They truly want to be accepted. We all do. And yet we have often compartments in our lives of those we will accept and those we won't. How about this one? Let me hit home a little bit more. How about family life? I know this is my own life at times. God's convicted me in these areas. This, this area where, where shadow racism can manifest itself. Your home life, and particularly with your kids, your children. What do they hear you say? What do they see you do? How are you shaping their thinking, their perspectives? Does a viewpoint toward uh, a people of color come out as you drive along in the car or walk through a mall or watch the news? Do, do you see someone or say something and have an opinion about that culture or that eth- ethnic group? What do you say in your family? What would your kids say about you in regards to how you view different cultures and different people? See, these are the areas that surface the issues of racism in our hearts. Oh, the big things, of course, we agree, and I'm not a racist. I don't have a racist bone in my body, we may say. And and on all those big issues, of course, we would agree, but it's these moments where God wants to surface the individual issues in our life where he wants to show us, hey, you are not being the kind of image bearer that I created you to be. And are we willing to deal with those issues? Are we willing to deal with those thoughts, those feelings, those emotions when God surfaces them in our life? So what do we do with these shadow racial attitudes in our lives? Well, this is what we do. This is what we do when we we have any kind of sin in our lives. You know what we do? We repent. We ask God to forgive us. It starts with us, the church, followers of Jesus, and with personal and corporate repentance whenever and whenever is needed. Now, let me just say this, by the way. This is, for, this is for all people and all races and all ethnic groups, by the way. See, racism can flow in all directions. Not just white towards blacks, but blacks towards whites, indigenous towards whites, whites towards Asians. I mean, the list goes on and on. There is no end to how it can manifest itself. As followers of Christ and as a community of Christ, we, we, are, we are the hope of the world. We have this message of reconciliation. That is the gospel, the good news, that God reconciles all people to himself, but also reconciles us to one another. And modeling to the world what community is meant to be, this is what God has called us to do. So when racism rears its head blatantly or in the shadow form, turn from it. Repent of it. Ask for forgiveness 
God, renew my mind. Renew my spirit. Make me a true image bearer of you. There's a promise in the Bible from God himself. He gives it to King Solomon. It's a verse that if it takes root in your life, if it takes root in the church where it should, it could then break out into the world and really can make a change in our nation and in our world. Let me read it to you. It's going to be on the screen. Let me say it to you. It says this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and what? I will heal their land. What a great truth. What a great promise. What a great invitation from God himself for us to get on our knees and repent of those attitudes and feelings, those shadow forms of racism in our lives and allow God to make us more and more like him so that we can actually see the world and the people transformed around us with the love and peace of Jesus Christ. So let me just close with this. Let me give you five things we can do to be the kind of community that God calls us to be. Here's the first thing I want you to do. I want, I want us to make a commitment just to hold each other accountable. Hold each other accountable. If you see or hear anyone doing anything that is racist in nature, well, learn to confront it. Pull that person aside and say, look, that's not who you are as an image bearer. That's not who Jesus and what Jesus is all about. I mean, you know, that joke was racist. It wasn't funny. See, we're better than that. Encourage someone. Come alongside them. You know, one of the things that I find is that, is that black people, indigenous people, uh, and, and, and bring an awful lot of baggage to the table, and rightfully so because of the things they've gone through. But white people bring a lot of ignorance to the table. And we, we, we can be the most insensitive people around. And everyone brings a whole lot of fear because we're scared to talk about things. We're scared to hold each other accountable. We're scared to call people and each other out. And we just have to learn to talk as a family. Let's just talk it out. Let's be upfront with one another. Let's, let's speak and confront one another with the truth in love as scripture says. This is the first thing we can do. Secondly, we need to educate each other. Help people know what's offensive and why. Take time to learn. Don't just take offense or get a chip on your shoulder or assume the worst. Let's just talk it out. Can we do that? I mean, we live in a culture you can't even talk. You have a disagreeing uh, you know, opinion or, or, or perspective and all of a sudden we're enemies instead of why can't we just talk things out? Why can't we just have a conversation? Here's how the Apostle Paul wrote about this in the Bible. When you're interacting with someone who's a brother or a sister in Christ who's out of line, does something offensive, he says, you know what, be family-ish. You know, understand that they're a brother or sister in the Lord. Here's his words. He says this in, 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 in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 14. He says, don't treat that person as an enemy. Sit them down. Talk about the problem as someone who cares. Imagine if we did more of that. I think this world would change, wouldn't it? Our relationships would be stronger. Let's educate one another. And then number three, intentionally build friendships with people from different cultures. Man, some of the richest conversations I've had are with people who have grown up in a different part of the world, a different country, a different culture than I have. Ask their name. Find out the name of their kids. Find out what they like, where they're from, what they enjoy doing. Broaden your relational world. And as the relationship grows, get to know them for who they are as a person. And, and understand their culture and where they've come from. Listen, it'll give you understanding. It'll actually create opportunities for that relationship to be strengthened. There's beauty and diversity. Remember, we're made uniquely and diversely by God. He's put us in different places around the world. We have different backgrounds and, and experiences, and that's a beautiful thing to learn about. Don't get caught up in just your culture. And then don't be afraid to talk about ethnic differences. See, we can get nervous asking others about their ethnicity and the differences between your culture and theirs. But, but don't be afraid. Be respectful, but ask. I've often maybe sitting in a, in a, in a chair getting my hair cut and I, rec and I, I don't recognize a, an accent in the person cutting my hair. And I'll, I'll just begin to ask, hey, what's your, where is your accent from? Where did you grow up? Tell me about that. Are, are people, whenever I travel, just wanting to hear things? Don't be afraid to talk about those differences. Differences can be really good. And, and, and you can learn a lot about a person by understanding their culture. We don't have to be walking on eggshells. I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just be free and make a commitment to be free about this, to, to be respectful and talk to one another about our differences so we can learn who that person is. And then number five, help your church. 
So no matter your culture, and especially if you are from another culture, don't be afraid to step up and step in. My prayer is that we as a church would become more and more diverse culturally as our community grows. Before I came here, I pastored in, in Richmond for a number of years. And, and, and the church, I mean, I, I was the minority the, as the white guy in that congregation. Our potlucks were amazing. I mean, we had great food from every part of the world. It was just, and, and I just often think about how, how amazing that was and, and how it was a, a, a taste of, I think, what heaven's going to be. Because it's all peoples, all cultures, all nations. But I want you here at Main Street to be, not be afraid to step up and step in. I, I want to see more and greater diversity on our stage on Sundays and in the, the ministries we do. And you may say, well, you don't really do the kind of music that I do. And I would say, well, that's because we don't have you on the team yet. Dean would love to hear some of your styles and musics and things that we can learn from another. And other parts, well, I have ideas about this or, or some outreach or whatever. Hey, let's hear it. Let's hear it. How can we reach more people with the good news, a reconciling message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let me close with this truth. You both, you, you know that, we both, we, we both know that oil and water don't mix, don't we? Uh, I mean, you just get a, a, a bottle of, um, of salad dressing, and you can't really see it here, but, but uh, it's made up basically of oil and water and a few other things thrown in there. And it separates, doesn't it? And so what do you do when you go into the, go into the fridge? You, you grab this, and then what you do is that you take this, and, uh, and you go, okay, we've got some salad. We're going to make some food. You get this. You see it separated. What do you, you shake it up, don't you? You, 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 you take, you take this, this oil and this water that's made up in, in, this, in this salad dressing. You shake it up, and you pour it out, and you use it. But, but you, know, you, you get it going. You, you get these two things. Two ingredients together, and what do you got to shake up? You know, this is kind of what the world does, doesn't it? We come together, we kind of shake things up. Let's try to make it happen. Let's try to get together. Let's try to be peaceful. And then what happens, though? You, you finish your food, or you finish that conversation, or you finish that moment, and you put it back down. And what happens? It segregates again, doesn't it? It separates again. After a while, oh, they were together for a bit, but, but after a few moments, or even in your own life, a few days, you may not even think about that person again. All of a sudden, everything just, once again, separates. That's salad dressing kind of life. That's the world that we live in. But what happens with salad dressing is very different than what happens with mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is the same thing. Mayonnaise is mostly composed of oil and water, but it doesn't have to be shaken it doesn't have to be shaken. Why? Because it has in it an emulsifier. And what is the emulsifier? The emulsifier are eggs. And an emulsifier is what brings things together that otherwise would never come together. The eggs bring two ingredients that would not normally mix with one another. And the egg infiltrates both the, um, both the oil and water so that they become together as a solid substance. It's the same thing, but they're solid. And you put this thing away, it stays the same. They're still together. It's all there. It's one content. And this is what, I want you to understand, this is what Jesus did when he died on the cross. This is what he accomplished when he went and gave his life to reconcile us to himself and to one another. The cross acts as an emulsifier that brings people together. Even those who would not normally come together. Even those who would not naturally come together. This is the gospel. It breaks down the walls of differences and places us on equal ground, on level ground, before the cross, before our Savior, Jesus Christ. And what Jesus accomplished on the cross is what deals with the evil of racism. The cross surfaces the shadows of racism in all of our hearts and in all of our lives. And it's, it brings to the surface those areas and feelings and emotions and biases that push against the reconciling power of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I'm telling you, church, when we get this, he begins to deal with the, the personal racial biases in our lives that he begins to show us, oh, Sean, Sean, that's not me. That's not my image. I want to deal with that in your life. I want to, I want to be the emulsifier that, that would naturally pushes you away or maybe gives you a wrong opinion or causes you to think this about a person or someone else or a race or a culture. I want to, I want to get rid of that and I want to be the emulsifier that brings what maybe naturally wouldn't come together and bring it all together. Because that is the gospel message. It is the reconciling power of Jesus Christ on the cross, him crucified and resurrected. 
And church, if we get this message in our hearts and we make it personal and not just some kind of topic out there and we don't just think of it from an institutional perspective, but we go, where, Lord, in my life do you want to surface the shadows of racism where I have repelled rather than embraced, where I have pushed away rather than allowed you to bring me together? God, would you break down those feelings in my life, those mindsets, those traditions, those things in my background that have caused me to believe lies as truths? And if we would all be willing to be honest and invite the Holy Spirit to begin to convict us of our racial biases, I'm telling you, we can be a force to be reckoned with in this world of the reconciling power of Jesus Christ, the gospel that is the good news. And so the challenge this morning, church, is for you. It's not for the person beside you. It's not for the guy that you think is a racist down the road. It's not for the person or what you think people should be thinking. It's for you. It's for me. Holy Spirit, where do you want to heal me? Holy Spirit, where do I need to repent so that I can be an agent of the reconciling power of Jesus Christ that brings your love and truth into every relationship so that I can bring your grace together, even with those I disagree with, even with those maybe I don't like even, for whatever reasons, but God, break that down Break that down in my heart. Break it down in your heart. Invite him to do a work so that we can be the reconcilers that we were created to be because we are made in his image, the one who reconciles all people to himself. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning, God, that we would be people who carry this emulsifying agent being the gospel, the good news. And Lord, we first wanna be people that repent of our own racial biases and ask God that you would help us to be honest about those areas in our lives that segregate others from us rather than invite them. And Lord, that you would help us to understand that you died for that. And God, that we would walk in the fullness of all that you have for us. And then Lord, that we would be agents of reconciliation in a world that is so divided, in a world that is so messed up that we would be agents of reconciliation just as you reconciled us to you. May we bring that message to the world around us. Help us, Lord. Deal with us, Lord. And then fill us with your spirit so that we can truly be all that you've called us to be. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray in every room around this city, country, and nation. Everyone said, so be it. Amen and amen.